everyone, and welcome to WCNC Charlotte's Off the Clock with Carboni podcast. I'm your host, WCNC Charlotte Sports Director Nick Carboni. As you can tell, still working from home, staying safe, but still want to put this uh, podcast together every single week. We ended last year with a really good one from Rod Boone, uh, formerly of The Athletic, still covering the Charlotte Hornets with his own website now. Great if you want to check that out. I know we're about six or seven games into the season, but a lot of that stuff still holds. But we've got great guests, everybody from Eugene Robinson to Richie Schaefer, a former area baseball product who put out his own science fiction book. And this week, we've got John Ellis. You might know him best by his Twitter profile, at One Panther Place. I noticed John a couple of years ago, it's this guy that was tweeting everything that I was seeing at training camp. And I didn't know where he was, but eventually met him. Uh, got to know him really well and, and has have seen his um, his site, his social media profile, and his kind of um, presence really on the, the Panthers beat grow over the last few years. And now him and uh, Billy Marshall have a podcast called The Roar that we're going to talk about as well. Of course, there's a lot to talk about with this team from what do they do at quarterback going forward? Because clearly the play of Teddy Bridgewater was not good enough. How do we feel about Matt Rule after one season? What will this new analytics-minded GM look like? What will it look like for the team? So lots to get to. Quick reminder, uh, I'm on your TV on WCNC Charlotte every Monday through Friday at 6 and 11. And one more Sunday, we've got Wild Card Weekend, Browns Steelers on WCNC Charlotte Sunday night. And Saturday night, we've got a game two. Me, Ron Rivera's Washington football team taking on Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the NFC Wild Card game. So... With that, I will get to our great conversation, as always, with John Ellis. Hey, John, thanks for joining me, and and we really got to stop meeting like this. I I, I think we need to go have a cold one somewhere at some point down in Spartanburg this summer. the, 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 the The Zoom way is the only way right now, unfortunately, but it's great to be on with you, man. Um. So tell us about One Panther Place and the Roar podcast. Start with the podcast because I know you and Billy have got a really, really intriguing one concerning uh, the GM search coming out this week. Yeah, we do. And, and thanks for the plug, by the way. You can find it on uh, bluewirepods.com, uh, but it's also on iTunes, Spotify, all that good stuff. And the, the Billy and Marshall and I have been doing this for this is episode 51 now. It's hard to believe. You've been yeah. on one of our shows, I know. And it yep. was... Uh, it was a good conversation we had leading up to this season. But uh, the, the latest episode, we're talking to Evan Lazar, who covers the Patriots, uh, Nick Underhill, who covers the Saints, just to get a pulse on some of these GM candidates we're hearing. And, of course, Nick Casario is in Houston now. But there, there's another candidate there in New England that possibly could make his way to Carolina. And then, of course, the Jeff Ireland speculation. And then there's some Chiefs connections, too, we're talking to. So stay tuned to that. That's coming up uh this week uh, on the Roar Podcast. I appreciate the plug, man. Yeah, absolutely. And and that is such an important move that the Panthers are, are needing to make. So uh, exactly where can everybody find that podcast episode? You just go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, search uh, the Roar Panthers podcast. Uh, you can go to bluewirepods.com. It'll be up there. You can go to our mm. Twitter feed. It's, it's always pinned to the top because uh, we got to get the word out about yeah. it. Uh, we're a niche pod. So we, we do well here uh, in our little nest we do, but uh, it's hard to get the word out sometimes. So, uh, again, appreciate you plugging that out for us. Yeah, it's really good. And anytime you bring on folks like you guys have talking about the GM search, you're, you're casting a wide net with uh, what people know and, 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 you know, what the hire might become. And we'll delve into that. I do want to talk about One Panther Place because, to me, it started to kind of show up. I'd be down in Spartanburg, and then I'd see this guy tweeting from this account. And then I'd like look around and I'd be like, where is he? Um, so I know you've, you've really had to hustle this. And I feel like just from the outside looking in, it's really taken, taken hold this last year and a half or so. So tell me about how it started and where it is and what you want it to become. Oh, we've been lucky, man. I mean, like, like I said, you know, I've been following and you see the hat here. So, I mean, there's some bias <laughs> on I've been following this team for 26 years. It's going on now. And it's been, uh, an interesting journey. So my, my brother, James, who works for the Panthers now mm-hmm. on the guest relations side, and I this is before he got that job, decided, hey, you know what, let's channel some of this energy from the fan side into something constructive because we've been football nuts all our life. He knows more than I do in terms of the game, but I've learned a lot from some good people in terms of film study. I've played 
played played a little bit in high school there. Okay. Yeah. Like a, Uncle Rico. <laughs> Uncle Rico action. But uh, no, I mean, uh, what we try to do here with 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 our Twitter account basically is add a little satire, you know, because it's football. We all got to laugh and keep it light. So that's mm-hmm. the first mission here. It's just to create a culture. I hate that word culture. Why did I just say that? <laughs> Create a culture where we can all laugh at what's going on because you can't take it too seriously in 2021. But also, you know, interject some things I think we're missing from some Panthers analysis. And that's no offense to you or Joe or Elena or any of the people out there doing it. They, they, it's it, You guys do a great job covering. I'm friends with a lot of them, uh, including yourself. But I think without having access, um, where I have to get an edge here is just grinding the tape understanding the nuances of what's going on with this team from an X and O perspective. Of course, Billy's great at that as well. He helps me out a ton in terms of the podcast side. But uh, essentially, it's just a content factory. We, we go back in the vault and look at the history of the team. Uh, we, we take a look at some of the great moments from the Cam Newton era, from the Steve Berline era, back all the way to the Kerry Collins, Dom Capers days, yeah. uh, the Cardiac Cats days. Uh, we've been fortunate to talk to some of the you know players from that era. Deshaun Foster was on our podcast, uh, who had the yeah. year run in Philadelphia to yeah. send the Super Bowl. That's a good but, one. You know, t- if you asked me a couple years ago if I would be you know in a semi-respectable position doing analysis for the Panthers, I would have laughed at you. But we took a leap and put a lot of time and effort into it. I remember I saw you at that 2019 <clears> camp, <throat> and uh, no, I, I mean I didn't get a press pass, but not a lot of people do. So you just go yeah. out there, you take your camera. You hustle, you make things happen, and uh, I think we take a lot of pride in doing it that way. I feel like in that door behind you, it leads down to like an NFL film style vault of the Panthers. We won't, I'm not going to ask you where you get all that stuff because that's, that's part of what adds some great um, depth to what you guys do is the history. Uh, but I got to know, like if, I like, if I'm like John, I need a clip from scene 36 of Goodfellas. <laughs> like you're just like, bam. This right here, yeah. <laughs> this is where it all happens. I'm going to be honest with you. I've got three kids. I've got a dog, two cats. The <laughs> house is a mess right now. And if you go into here, I mean, let's just go to to my photos here. Um, th- this is th- this is where all the magic happens. Oh my goodness! Right here. That's we we screen cap the all twenty two yeah. stuff. We go into Luma Fusion and cut up some stuff. I mean, it's wherever I can <clears> find <throat> time. I do radio for iHeart on the Clemson side, and, yep. and that consumes probably most of my time right now in terms of actual earning a paycheck and it's right. great work. I love doing that. But this stuff, whether you're sitting in the car, picking up the kids, uh, you know, you're in the drive through line, which I should be doing less of given my, <laughs> um, you find time wherever. And we, we do a lot of auto tweets too, that kick out at night to keep the train rolling. So honestly, you know, it's just, um, my, my dad who's worked in the media biz for, for a long time, gave me some advice. He said, look, if you really want to you know, get back into this yep. game, um into your 40s here you're just gonna have to work really hard not expect anything in return and it'll pay off so yeah honestly it's it's a labor of love and we enjoy the hell out of it yeah it's really it's honestly been fun watching it grow john because i mean this year you've been uh you've been on radio you've been on television which we all know how important that is (laughs) but certainly you do right (laughs) (laughs) but you guys have done a great job I, i just real quick before we really dive into stuff um the film study aspect of it because I have no problem telling anybody like I'm you know, like my dad was a coach, but like I never watched film with him. I kind of wish I had. And if I did now, he'd be like, I mean, he was a high school coach in the '90s, so it's like not even close to the same. They ran like the wishbone. So, um, how did you get so ingrained in film? How did you learn about what you were seeing? Obviously, you have a bit of a playing background. Um, yeah, I, I guess just how 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 did you kind of pick all that stuff up? Well, I tell you that one of my first football influences was Danny Ford, and this goes way back. My dad, if you guys don't know, mm-hmm. worked at, at iHeart Media down in Greenville. He's sort of a country music legend. He's done country radio, yep. from, I guess. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> years, I think, he's been in this business almost. And Danny Ford, after he retired from, uh, moved on from Clemson, and it was in yeah. between the Clemson, Arkansas period, I think. God, it's been so long. Danny used to come and do shows with dad like every Wednesday. And I, as a kid, I used to go in and just hang out with him. Right. So, you want to be around him. Yeah. You want to be around him. And, you know, I was able as a like, kind of a teenager to pick his brain on football a little bit. You know, obviously wow. it's a much different game Danny Ford used to run than what's being run now. Yeah. But football's football. So that sort of got me interested in the game. I played mm-hmm. high school football at J.O. Man. I didn't play it very well. I was one of those tight ends like uh, Chris Manhurts. Chris Manhurts, nothing against you. You're a great player. But I know the drill. you got to block. You can't yeah. catch the ball. 
Uh, and I was the same way. I was asked to do the dirty work. So after that, I never played college ball, but I always took an interest whenever I could throughout this, you know, past two decades, whenever I get my hand on some tape or even just looking at the broadcast stuff, trying to pick apart some of the things. One of my big influences have been Pat Kerwin. Pat does a show with Jim Miller, our good friend yep. on Sirius XM, and he wrote a great book called Keep Your Eye Off the Ball. And it teaches you some right. real core fundamentals. And it could be for any fan. I mean, I was a fan. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not Matt Bowen here. I didn't play 10 years in the league. So I had to learn this stuff. But, there, you know, guys like Mark Schofield, who played uh, at Wesleyan, and then, you know, Doug Farrar, who, who doesn't have much of a playing background, but is a tremendous film analyst. And I think most of Twitter is the same way. A lot of these guys never really played or they played other <laughs> sports. Um, you just get to understand what the core principles are. One thing I try to do when I study film is, is unless it's egregious, I, I, you know, and I've been hard on Bridgewater this year. We'll get to that, I'm sure. Yeah. But I, I, it, nothing personal. There's no personal attacks behind it. It's all based on what we see. Is there a read he misses? Is there something obvious there from a, um, you know, from an accuracy perspective that looks off from a time? The same with Cam too. We did the same with him back in the day. So um, we, we try to be fair. And then the one advice I give to people looking to do this I know a lot of young people, I'm sure they've done this to you. They DM you saying, how can I get into the business? How can I do this? Number mm -hmm. one, don't expect to be paid a dime because yeah. it's a labor of love. It will lead to that at some point. Number two, don't overstep your bounds with your analysis. Unless you know what you're talking about in that moment, don't say it. Because that happened to me one time with a mm -hmm. player, and his name was Jadon Mickens. And it was at the same camp yeah. you and I were at. And I made yeah. a point to say, oh, he's muffed his second punt of the camp. And I looked at my notes afterwards, and I said, no. No, he didn't. No, that was somebody yeah, else. Yeah. And Jadon retweeted me. <laughs> I was like, yeah. dude. It's so happened to everybody. <laughs> I, I guess the best advice I could give people is just if you're going to go down the mm -hmm. film analysis road, um, don't be too specific unless you absolutely know. Because there's a big difference between what I do and what any low-level coach in the NFL does. It's it's night and day. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's right. Let's, uh, we're, we're taping this here on Wednesday, John, and there's news coming out today that Jake Pete's Carolina's quarterbacks coach who, who spent time as Carolina's running backs coach under Ron Rivera. It's going to be the offensive coordinator at LSU. Carolina's offensive coordinator Joe Brady get, making the rounds. Looks like three interviews and, and we'll see if things change by the time this drops on Friday. How concerned are you specifically about Carolina maybe losing Joe Brady, which I don't think an NFL team is going to bite, but you just never know the way things have gone. Well, I mean, I saw Ethan Albright's report earlier who does really good work uh, out of, I think, Denver, and he's a, a good, solid reporter with his sourcing, and he said the interview with Brady uh, went very well. I mean, they're very impressed, and that doesn't surprise me. You've covered mm -hmm. Brady in these Zoom calls. He's very impressive in terms of the way he communicates and messages. You know, I know from a football perspective, I am concerned. I mean, it's I, I'm not surprised. I mean, I think we all expected with this hire he was going to be a hot commodity. The production hasn't been great. You know, who knows whose idea it was to bring Bridgewater here. I know it was a collaborative effort, I think, between Joe. I mean, you can't say it wasn't partially Joe's idea because yeah. of the uh, New Orleans connection. But at the same time, um, I think Matt Rule is a guy who, you know, as a CEO type, we look at him and say, you know, what does he specialize in? He's not really an offensive guy, defensive guy. And I think that's to his advantage right now because, honestly, he's coached every position group in the league. He has an understanding of, I think, of what he's going to have to do moving forward. I'm sure Matt, being the smart guy that he is, has a contingency plan for this. The key is everybody's got a plan in the league, Nick. I mean, you don't make it yeah. to that level unless you have a plan. <clears throat> Will it work? Um, Jeff Nixon's a guy that I wrote about last spring, the, the running back coach I'm sure you've met before. And, you know, Jeff is a guy who was the co-offensive co coordinator at Baylor. He's got good experience. He ran some good up-tempo stuff there, much like Joe Brady was a co-OC at LSU. So I think you can dive into the what-ifs of, you know, um, you know who, who will the next guy be based on the connection to Matt Rule. But they might go in-house here. That's just based on a gut feeling. I have no reporting on, on, on that end. But I know Joe Person had put something out yesterday about that being a possibility too, so we shall see. Um, and moving along to the general manager search, I'd ask you what the profile is, but I think Dave Tepper has mostly answered what the profile is. I'm not sure all six gentlemen that they're interviewing fit that exact profile, but we think it's going to be analytically driven, and we hear that and we hear that. So I didn't want to just ask you that and have you say it. Like, what is that going to look like when they do hire the general manager as they head into this offseason, which, you know, they have a lot of holes to fill. I mean, what does that 
look like for this team going forward. It's, you know, listen, they've had Herney and Gettleman for the last however many years. So it's going to be a, a, a big difference. It's a, it's a big piece of the puzzle in terms of changing things over here. You know, Marty, of course, was the, the holdover we all talked about. And, and a lot of people, including myself, were, were fairly critical of, of Dave sort of putting things on autopilot with that, I think. But, you know, t- to be fair, Dave had a lot of other things going on. He had the soccer stuff he's got to deal with. He's looking to build a stadium. Um, he's got his other side of his business, too, that I'm sure. And he, he, to his point, he made it a point to say, you know, I had to take a couple of years to clean up the business end of things. So mm-hmm. I think he wanted to give Ron one more year. And then again, to Marty's point, give him another year to sort of transition. So I'm not so critical on keeping him around. Moving forward, I mean, I think Jeff Ireland's an interesting candidate. Um, he's somewhat familiar. I, mean, I think he, I think he played at Baylor. I want to say that he did. I'm not yes, sure. he did. And so there is a, like a late eighties. So there's a loose connection. Angel like, Hey, kind of connection. what was your favorite burger joint in Waco <laughs> right. kind of thing? You know, I, I like Ireland a lot. And a lot of people were turned off by some of the Dak Prescott stuff that came out a while back. Some of the questions he asked, but I think he, he rebounded himself with getting to new Orleans He's now a player personnel guy there, and he's running the college scouting side. And look, if you're talking about building through the draft, as Dave Tepper and Matt Rule have said, you could argue nobody has done that better than Jeff Ireland in New Orleans. I mean, they have got just Marshawn Lattimore, Hendrickson. uh, Their draft on defense has been remarkable. They picked up, of course, Taysom Hill on that front. And um, they've gotten a lot of value out of Jeff Ireland. So that would mean – I haven't had a chance, Nick, to really size them up one by one. Of course, the pod coming up here this week. But Ireland's a guy that I keep an eye on now. He has got quite the personality. We've seen him on Hard Knocks with yeah. uh, Joe Philbin back in the day with Miami. Uh, he's a Parcells guy. He's no nonsense. And Matt Roll, you've gotten to know him a little bit. He's kind of the same way. I mean, he's yeah. kind of an alpha. So I'd be interested to see the dynamic between the two of them. Um, Pat Stewart's also in the building too, and he hasn't been talked about a lot. I know he's the player personnel director. <clears throat> I almost wonder if they get to a point where they interview all these guys and they say, you know what, maybe let's give Pat an interview and push him up. I just don't know. And you, you can pair him with the cap guy that you already have, and then right. maybe there's some some synergy there. I don't know. Culture and synergy. We've already dropped the two buzzwords. So. <laughs> synergy, culture. Process will be next, Nick. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> all right. So Let's get on the field here, John, and and we know that there are so many needs. The quarterback play needs to be better, whether it's a new quarterback or not. So as you've kind of dug in here after the season, I know maybe maybe you're not completely completely done yet. What what is it that held Teddy Bridgewater back, especially the second half of the season? Um, well, some of it was Teddy Bridgewater, to be honest. I mean, you know, here, let's just be fair about it. He started the season exactly as I thought he would by looking at the tape from last summer. You know, we analyzed a good bit of his film from New Orleans. And the one thing I said in our season preview was you should expect a distribution type of quarterback. I hate game manager. It's another one of those that I, I can't stand. But in terms of a, he's like a point guard, you know, it's going to be intermediate stuff. The anticipation game was supposed to be his strength in two mm-hmm. To look back at it on tape so far, it hasn't been that great. I mean, he hasn't anticipated throws even in the intermediate part of the field as well as I thought. Now, granted, the left tackle situation is a hot mess. It has been for a long time. Yeah. But he's got weapons. He's got receivers. Um, Joe Brady, I don't put a lot of blame on him. I, I, you know, I think he did a good job of scheming up what he had. Is he ready to be a head coach? It's a different discussion. But I, I, think, I think you're seeing it in how much interest he's still getting. He, Despite yeah, some I mean, of these numbers not being where anybody expected. Right. I think numbers can lie a little bit, but but situational numbers mm-hmm. are what I look at. The red zone production in the last five games for Bridgewater, one touchdown, three picks. Uh, and I think it's been interesting, Nick. I haven't been in these Zooms, but you mm-hmm. have. And Coach Rule has been um, at times very apologetic for Teddy and in protecting his quarterback. But at times he's been very blunt about, now, look, we got to have better play here. We, it's unacceptable. Like right before the uh, the halftime of the Green Bay game where he fumbled, you know, telling, I, I believe, uh, who was the half? Was it Andrea Kramer? Who was working the halftime there? I believe so. And saying that he he kind of did his own thing again. It surprised second me a little bit. Yeah, it surprised me a little bit that he, that he did. But it's also part we'll of We'll see how that plays game. out going forward, especially if yeah. this team gets a little better and more high profile. If he, you know, he, he may rub some guys the wrong way, but Teddy he might. But I uh, think, I'm sure I think, he told him that too. I think Bridgewater understands that. And I think for folks who 
you know, and again, we do some satire on our page and that's, mm. it's all fair game, but Teddy, Teddy's interacted with the fans before and he's been very, <laughs> he's been <laughs> interesting at time with some yeah. of those tweets. So I don't think his feelings are hurt by anything we say. And, and 99% of our analysis is just film based. And it's like, look, I, I'm just not seeing it. Now the injury thing, you know, Matt brought that up. My question would be, why wasn't that more widely reported? I, I didn't yeah, see him put on that, maybe one injury that kind report of was, all year. Yeah. And then there was no off. injury report in the last game as he, I mean, it was, it totally felt like that was the time to bench him for performance. Right. It happened to coincide with, you know, maybe his ankle is a little swollen. Who knows? Who knows? It's, it's, it, it's been a weird season, but you know, I'm, I'm giving Matt some grace here because it's his first year doing it. And, uh, but to be fair, you know, 9 million a year, you got to get it right. Yeah. With, with Teddy Bridgewater, I mean, it's an evaluation year and I feel like they got more tape of him than you would even expect for a, him for a 15 game season he missed the one game because of the eight times that he had the ball with a chance to win or tie does that give you a little extra like feeling that okay we know who he is now sure i believe so i mean let's face it nick he hadn't played a full season since 2015 put in perspective that's the last time a Panthers quarterback won an MVP. So <laughs> it's been a minute. Um, that was my concern coming in. I wasn't one of these durability guys um, coming into it, you know, because they've heard that same narrative with Cam, and I think that it gets a little overplayed. Yeah. But I will say this. It, a lot of Teddy's, you know, dings this year in terms of injuries have, have come when he's doing things out of structure in terms of the running game. I mean, it, it, it worries me a little bit because he's not built like Julius Peppers. <laughs> so – I would be concerned in terms of, okay, if the coach is saying very blatantly in the press conference, Nick, that we need him to be healthier. you got to be available. He's got to have a big off season. Some took that as he's got to get stronger. I didn't take it that way. I just think he meant, you know, in general, he's got to have a better off season. But I, I, I just, from looking at the tape situationally down the stretch, you know, the Chicago game, he misses a seven route to DJ Moore that could have extended the game. Uh, the Denver game comes to mind where he rushes it before the yeah. two minute situationally in the red zone he fumbles it against the Packers going high when they told him to go low the miscommunication concerns me too they're giving him a lot of freedom pre-snap but yeah you got to win close games this league and Bridgewater over the years even when he was an effective starter he even brought this up in the presser too I thought it was kind of funny that uh, mm-hmm. I've been on a playoff team that won you know that 14 touchdowns so, yeah, it's not what we want to hear and and <laughs> lost because he left it up to the kicker so, you had Adrian Peterson in his prime too, so there's that. Um, you know, I don't know, Nick. It's uh, they've got to upgrade there. They're going to have to. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's okay if this is a total like no way. I mean, is there any way Teddy Bridgewater can turn this around here in Carolina? Because he there's a pretty solid shot he will be on the roster next year. I never say never. I've been fair about it. You know, look, I, I've been probably one of his biggest critics all throughout the season, and mm-hmm. it's you know. It's fair to say that the contract is prohibitive. He's not going anywhere next year. I mean, right. unless they find a trade partner, which they did for Kyle Allen, oddly enough. But mm-hmm. I think that was a unique situation yeah. with Ron Rivera and Scott Turner. Um, yeah, he's going to be starting probably the, the beginning of next year because if you look at the draft order, unless they blockbuster something and pull together you know, a monumental trade, I don't see anybody yeah. in line there in the draft that's ready to start. And why would you go sign a middling free agent when you already have yeah. Bridgewater on the roster? So. Hey, give him another shot. Let's see what he can do with maybe a better left tackle. Maybe they go that way in the draft. A little better defensive play over the stretch. I mean, not to be fair to Teddy, he did suffer late in games, but the defense went, what, two games in a row without, you know, forcing a punt. punt so there's yeah. that too. Um, I just think by the structure of his contract, he's going to get another shot, whether fans like it or not. And as I've said every week on Twitter, almost like a pronouncement on a – on a, I could just do a scheduled tweet. Fourth quarter of a game, okay, Teddy, here we are again. Let's see what we can do. And time and time again, yeah, um, yeah. as the quarterback, he has failed them. And uh, that's part of the position, Nick. Cam took yeah. the same criticism here, too, when he failed. And you have to overcome some of this stuff. I mean, McCaffrey was out. He's yeah. got four 1,000-yard guys. All right. So, right. so eighth, eighth pick, we don't have to go into how all that went down the last few weeks. But what, how much capital would you be comfortable giving up to move up to get – Zach Wilson or Justin Fields? I, I probably wouldn't give up a lot for those two, and that's no knock on those guys because I, I to this point I haven't done enough tape on either one mm-hmm. of them to tell you definitively, yeah, oh, I'd give up two number ones and mm-hmm. two number twos for him. Mm-hmm. The only guy I'd do that for is Trevor Lawrence. I mean, I, I, I've covered him at Clemson. 
I've yeah. seen him up close. I've, I'm more familiar with him. And I think by far, um, even without looking at the other guy's tape extensively, I think he's the best quarterback in this draft. Maybe one of the best that have come out in the last four or five years. I don't think you're going to miss with Trevor. I really don't. So I'd be willing just from an analyst perspective to, you know, do one yeah. of those Jared Goff type of, you know, Carson Wynn, you know, these trades where you're really <laughs> giving up a lot because if you get that quarterback, yeah. if you get that quarterback, man, I, I think people underestimate sometimes how far that can take you. And you can always recoup some of these assets. The problem is Carolina did it. We called it a baby tank. You did it. They did a half a tank this year. Right. They didn't go all in with it. And I, the tanking, I hate that word, but again, if you're going to totally restructure your organization and your roster, Signing Bridgewater and Robbie Anderson, both of whom played solid this year, Anderson better than, than Bridgewater, and then giving McCaffrey, who's a running back, a, a gargantuan contract, you know, and he missed the season, Nick, and missed most of yeah. it. So I, I just think those are decisions you're going to have to reevaluate a year from now. But no, I, I wouldn't trade it for anybody unless it was Lawrence. And even then, I would, you know, I'd have to look closely at it. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like a quagmire that really they put themselves in by hitching their wagon to Teddy Bridgewater is okay. Next year, the roster will be a little better. You hope McCaffrey is, is healed up. If they don't draft a quarterback at eight and they've got Bridgewater for the 2021 season, you'd like to think they do a little better than getting the eighth pick after. So like there are other ways to procure a franchise quarterback, but it's a little more difficult than picking in the top five. So is there anything they can do this off season to take a look? Are there any of these, you know, cast-offs that could have a Ryan Hanna, Tannehill-type turnaround here in Carolina? I don't think so, Nick. I, yeah. I, not, not that I see right now. I think their best bet – I mean, you know, Deshaun Watson doesn't seem too thrilled about what's going on in Houston right now. He, I don't blame him. They, they tore that roster to shreds. Yeah. Uh, they took away Hopkins. They, he's had nothing to work with. The offensive line, as, as, as Panthers fans can understand, has been terrible, so he's frustrated. I, that's that's one of the few guys I would trade the farm for because he's so dynamic. And I sound like a Clemson homer here, but uh, Deshaun, the proof is in the tape there. Um, as far as mid-level free agents, I mean, I just don't see anybody on that list that would compel me to be any bread, any better than Bridgewater. And and to you know, to be fair, Teddy's still got a twenty-plus million dollar cap hit next year, so you're yeah. still at that point you're left with two middling quarterbacks with mid-range starter money. Um, I don't know. I know a lot of folks want Cam to come back. Folks, it's not happening. It's never yeah. happening. So we need to let that one go. It just feels like they've got to have this figured out by the time Matt Rule enters that third season. I mean, if you don't have it by then, I know it's a seven-year deal, but it starts to get a little dicier. If, if you're yeah, just kind of middling like this. I don't think they have anybody currently on the roster behind uh, Teddy that, that is the answer. I like PJ a lot, but you know, even the Lions game, he made some errors, and, and that was a terrible pass defense he faced there. So I pumped the brakes on that. And uh, Will Greer, I mean, we covered his first camp together, and it was not pretty. And he just – I like the kid. He's a local guy. I wish him all the best. But I don't think this regime, given the fact that Tommy Stevens was plugged in ahead of him for various reasons, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be keeping Will Greer much longer. Let's talk about, uh, you know, it, it seems to be – the way this has been framed in terms of – from the Panthers with cap space, it's, it's – got to be like – Taylor, team Taylor Moten, team Curtis Samuel. So conventional wisdom says go with the offensive tackle. But, man, Curtis Samuel's made that decision a lot tougher. Yeah, he's so good. He's so good. Here, here's, 24 here's, years old, too. He's a young guy. And here, I talked with, with my brother about this the other day, and he, he gave me an opinion I, I sort of looked at, and I, I kind of agree with to a certain degree. Your, your core guy's moving forward. Your big three that you should focus on. And he said this, not me, but I tend to agree with it. Taylor Moten, CMC, who you have already lined up here, and there's no mm -hmm. getting out of that. Good, bad, yeah. whatever you feel about mm -hmm. it. And then DJ Moore. I think yeah. that's where you have to look for. Curtis, to me, I, I love him, but if they have to get into a situation where they need to cut one of those two loose, Taylor has been a consistent player on that right side, and they desperately need a good tackle moving forward, right, left side, yeah. whatever it is. Curtis is, is, is very good. He led the league in catch percentage this year. He is so dynamic. But with McCaffrey coming back, you're paying him to fill some of those voids. So I think what McCaffrey can yeah. do to fill that void would be playing out in the slot, getting involved in the passing game, and also being the kind of runner that Curtis has been yeah. this year. So I think you got to focus on what's important to your core. DJ is somebody you got to lock up long term. Yep. Taylor, I think, too, and then uh, they'll go from there. Defensively, I mean, if you had told me before this season, this I mean, they're a top 20 defense when you look at average passing yards and average rushing yards. I know a lot of people like yourself get – 
get more into it with, with analytics. So I'd like to see where you think they fall and where, where they fall compared to what you expected them to be. Oh, I think they exceeded expectations. You know, Billy and I had a podcast. We addressed this uh, about five weeks ago. This is after the Minnesota game that, uh, you know, fire, fill, snow, fire, fill, snow. A lot of people were calling for it. They said, first of all, it's not realistic because nobody mm-hmm. does that halfway through their first year. But I think Phil's done a really good job, Nick, in terms of solidifying a young group. Um, the third down stuff sucks. I mean, they got to get better there. It's been off and on. Uh, I know they post a stat that they give the most first downs in, in team history. But honestly, everybody's getting first downs this year. First downs, are, it's a bit of a skewed yeah. stack because defensive uh, teams have had a harder time this year in general. Uh, I, I like what Phil's doing. I like what Jeremy Chin brings. Obviously, yeah. he's not going to win defensive rookie of the year probably at this point, but he's uh, in the top three, I would think. And then Brian Burns, what can you say about this guy? Paired along Derek Brown, who exceeded my expectations in the passing game. Uh, Burns is a superstar. I mean, we've talked about this, you and I. Mm-hmm. He's going to be a, a – a Julius Peppers type force for this organization long-term, I think in terms of the total package. Yeah. I think they've done a good job. They got to get another corner though. They got to get that at some point. Yeah. So that, that leaves, you know, I know they want to add pass rushers. You kind of always want to do that, but I think they've got some guys they feel good about their corner and middle linebacker. If it's, if you've got two guys that you really like evenly at eight, is it corner? I mean, cause Everybody got so used to Luke Keekley around here and, and how that really affects your entire defense. Well, I mean, you know, to get, get your freezing hot takes out or whatever the website is, because you never know how this is going to bite me, but I go corner. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not a fan of drafting linebackers early. Um, now, Keekley worked out. I mean, look, it happens. You Occasionally, you find a <laughs> linebacker that's just an absolute, you know, superstar. And there, there were some very well-paid analysts who took a big crap on Keekley before yeah. coming out about some of the things he wasn't good at, and he proved them wrong. Goes through a lot of this is a crapshoot. Patrick Sertan's a very good corner. I might look in that direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, his dad played in the league. Obviously, he has some experience uh, in terms of knowing the game. But I think they the, the priority in the draft, if it's defense, you've got to shore up that other side opposite Dante Jackson. It's Rasul Douglas. It's been a solid stopgap, but uh, he's not the answer. And, and it is a passing attack league, so it, it, sure it's got to be something that's your main well, focus. And, All right. and dynamically, the way they play defense, too, just real quickly, it's so much mm-hmm. hybrid stuff, too. And, and Jermaine Carter has played very well now that he's out of Rules Doghouse. Really <laughs> Which we didn't know was a thing. <laughs> Somebody commented to me and said, we had to deal with Whitehead because of a beef. I, yeah. like, I don't know the whole story. But, yeah, I think they've got to get better outside. You know, Boston's good player on the – Safety in, chins all over the field. Burris is serviceable, but the other side of corner has got to get better. Yeah. I thought Dante played pretty well this year, actually. Wrap it up with this. Uh, head coach Matt Rule, year one. What are your overall thoughts and impressions, and, and how are you feeling? Uh, how should fans be feeling about him entering this, this next season? Yeah, I was skeptical, Nick. I mean, I was right there with, with a lot of folks who, you know, the contract was a big one. It, it seemed like a bit of a hasty move. You had Marty and, and, and Tepper leading the search committee and then doing the meatball stuff and all that. And, um, you know, it turns out that this guy, you know, regardless of what you think about him and his style, he's a pretty good coach. I mean, he had this team competitive for almost every week. Uh, they ended on a sour note. But I, I, I do think he's going to be a playoff coach at some point. I, in fact, I, I talked to our, one of our analysts that we know very well on TV a couple of weeks ago, and I said, you know, I think this can be a playoff team next year. I don't think year mm-hmm. three is necessary if they do it right because the division is aging a little bit. You've got a bit of a window coming up here. So I think by at least year three, they should be you know, rolling. If they're not by year three, Nick, a seven-year contract or not, you know Dave Tepper. He's not entirely yeah. going to be patient to his word in terms of letting it play out more than three years if they're not in the playoffs. Dave, Dave hadn't been to the playoffs yet, Nick. He wants to be there. He wants Dave wants two things. He wants a roof and he wants the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not a doctor. I think we oh, we know that. that. Neither, hey, neither am I. 20, 2019. <laughs> John Ellis, One Panther Place, and the Roar Podcast. You the man. I got to get me one of those hats. Hey, man. Sideline cap. Hey, Merry Christmas. I, I'm totally unbiased, too. <laughs> always love chopping it up with john in person on zoom on social media again one panther place is where you follow him and and he's got no shortage of um humor analysis whatever you want from john he's he's there for panthers fans 
uh, and look forward to hoping, hopefully having him back on for the draft this year. We did it over Zoom last year, hopefully in person, in studio this next year. Thank you all for watching and listening. Do us a favor if you can, really help us out. Uh, hit subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube. Follow or, or subscribe if you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, however you get us. And once again, thank you for listening and watching to the WCNC Charlotte Sports Off the Clock podcast.